solution for humanity. Is there a father in this world who would not try to provide for his children and his wife? Is there a father in this world who would want to be locked up in a cell away? from his family is there a father in this world who would not defend justice and rights till the very end ladies and gentlemen assalamu alaikum and welcome to a meeting entitled shared values this is organized by brent islamic circle in association with forum for social studies from saudi arabia this is the first time that we've actually done an interactive meeting with Christian speakers. For those of you who think that this is going to be a debate and a slanging match, you could actually leave now because that's not the intention of the evening. The evening's intention is to try and understand each other's uh, viewpoints a lot further and to see what we have in common. Basically, the outline of the evening will be that shortly there will be a chronic recitation and a recitation from the Bible. Then we have Dr. Reverend William Taylor talking on community values and the role of religion in the next century. Then we have Dr. Naik from India speaking about family values. Then a further five minutes for Dr. William Taylor to comment on any of the earlier speakers. Between 10 and 11, there'll be an hour reserved for question and answers, and they will be purely written questions. There is paper on every seat. If anybody wants to ask a question, please just handwrite it and put it on one of the tables on the side, and we'll try and uh, answer as many as possible. I'd like now to uh, ask uh, Brother Tayeb Sharif, who is an A-level student hoping to go to university this year, to do a chronic recitation. Tayeb. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فما أوتيتم من شيء فمتاع الحياة الدنيا وما عند الله خير وأبقى للذين آمنوا وعلى ربهم يتوكلون وما عند الله خير وأبقى وما عند الله خير وأبقى للذين آمنوا وما عند الله خير وأبقى للذين آمنوا وعلى ربهم يتوكلون والذين يجتنبون كبائر الإثم والفواحش وإذا ما غدبوهم يغفرون والذين استجابوا لربهم بهم وأقاموا الصلاة وأمرهم شورا بينهم ومما رزقناهم ينفقون 
والذين استجابوا لربهم والذين استجابوا لربهم وأقاموا الصلاة وأمرهم شورا بينهم ومما رزقناهم ينفقون والذين إذا أصابهم البغي هم ينتصرون وجزاء سيئة سيئة مثلها فمن عفا وأصلح فأجره على الله فمن عفا وأصلح فأجره على الله إنه لا يحب الظالمين ولمن انتصر بعد ذلمه فأولئك ما عليهم من سبيل ولمن انتصر بعد ذلمه فأولئك ما عليهم من سبيل إنما السبيل على الذين يظلمون الناس ويبغون في الأرض بغير الحق أولئك لهم عذاب أليم ولمن صبر وغفر إن ذلك لمن عزم الأمور ولمن صبر وغفر إن ذلك لمن عزم الأمور صدق الله العظيم These are verses 36 to 42 of surah number 42, surah Shura. In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the giver of mercy. Whatever you are given here is but the enjoyment of this life. But that which is with Allah is better and more lasting. It is for those who believe and put their trust in their Lord, those who avoid the greater sins and indecencies, and when they are angry, even then forgive, those who respond to their Lord and establish regular prayer, who conduct their affairs by mutual consultation, who spend out of what we bestow on them for sustenance, and those who when an oppressive wrong is inflicted on them, are not cowed but help and defend themselves. The recompense for an injury is an injury equal thereto in degree. But if a person forgives and makes reconciliation, his reward is due from Allah. For Allah loveth not those who do wrong. But indeed, if any do help and defend himself, even after a wrong done to him, against such there is no cause of blame. The blame is only against those who oppress men with wrongdoing and insolently transgress beyond bounds through the land, defying right and justice. For such there will be a chastisement grievous. But indeed, if any show patience and forgive, that would truly be an affair of great resolution. Sadaqallahu al-Azim. Thank you very much, Tayyip. I'd now like to ask 
uh, Brother Brian Gates, who is a local councillor in the borough of Harrow, to do a short reading from the Bible. I'm reading two passages this evening, one from the Old Testament and uh, one from the New. And the Old Testament reading is in the book of Psalms, and it's Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. And the second reading from the Bible this evening is taken from the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament. And it's chapter 25, verses 34 to 46. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee, or thirsty, and give thee drink? And when did we see thee a stranger, and welcome thee, or naked, and clothe thee? And when did we see thee sick, or in prison, and visit thee? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when did we see thee hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to thee? Then he will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Thank you very much indeed. Now I'd like to welcome Reverend Dr. William Taylor, who is an Anglican priest and area dean of Ealing in West London. His academic background is in Middle Eastern languages, politics, and theology. He worked on his PhD thesis on non-Muslim minorities in the Ottoman Empire while training for the priesthood at Cambridge. Formerly on the Archbishop of Canterbury's personal staff at Lambeth Palace, his responsibilities were for relations with Orthodox churches, especially in the Near East. He was a chaplain to the British Embassy in Amman, Jordan, while acting as a consultant for Orthodox relations to the Diocese of Jerusalem. He has traveled extensively in most of the Turkic-speaking republics in Turkey and every Arab country except Mauritania. He is a writer and broadcaster, and as he's given me such a long introduction, maybe I could ask him to cut his speech down by a couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very grateful for this opportunity to be with you this evening and to listen to views and to share my own based on my own experience of working with Islam in the Middle East and in this country. My subject is one which I believe is especially important at the moment to all societies and particularly to those who are in a position to affect change within society. That's to say those in political authority the religious leadership, academic institutions, and those in public service, business, diplomats, as well as decent men and women of all walks of life. The question is this. What should be the role of religious faith in defining a community's values, direction, and even public policy? We can be sure of one thing 
This question is not going to go away, even in the liberal secular West. Last year, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington published a book entitled Religion, The Missing Dimension of Statecraft. The whole thesis of this book is that public policymakers, especially in the West, have consistently underestimated the potency of religious faith in forming public policy. In Western policymaking, who could have predicted, for example, the explosion of so-called ethnic and religious fervor which marked the collapse of the former Yugoslavia? In any case, such foresight would, I believe, have demanded more historical education than our political classes have been known for. Similarly, the religious leadership must play a more dynamic and creative role in conflict resolution. Now, in much of the world, we have underestimated for too long the ability of religion, of cultures and religions to create divisions. We have failed to grasp what that can mean, particularly for young people. Even more than ethnicity, religion discriminates sharply between people. For example, a person can be half French and half Arab, and simultaneously a citizen of two countries. It is more difficult to be half Catholic and half Muslim. One of the best-known Christian theologians, the German Roman Catholic theologian Hans Kung, gave a lecture in London last year entitled Towards a Global Ethic. His thesis, and mine today, is that the search for peace between the world faiths is one of the most urgent tasks facing humankind. He said this, Hans Kung, Without peace between the religions, war between the civilizations. No peace among the religions without dialogue between the religions. No dialogue between the religions without investigation of the foundations of the religions. I believe that analysis to be correct, and I want to give four pointers this evening, and I will be brief, which might be helpful to people of faith, in particular to Muslims and Christians. I do not believe that this is a specialist activity for academics and religious leaders, but needs to inform all aspects of private practice and public policy, especially in religiously plural societies such as our own. The four principles I want to suggest are these, and these are the four principles which the Archbishop of Canterbury used when he met the religious leadership in Al-Azhar in Egypt. And this is speaking especially in Christian relations with Islam. Firstly, friendship, not hostility. Secondly, understanding, not ignorance. Thirdly, reciprocity, not exclusivism. And fourthly, cooperation, not confrontation. And I'll briefly elaborate these headings. So firstly, friendship, not hostility. I choose to use the word friendship rather than the word tolerance. Tolerance, I believe, is often linguistically misused to mean an indifference towards those things we don't particularly care about. For example, I tolerate your smoking, but it really gets up my nose. True friendship is the uh, context where differences can be held harmoniously and where mutually exclusive beliefs can be held without antagonism or hatred. Dr. Albert Hurani, a world-class scholar of the Arab and Muslim world, wrote this, nobody can write with meaning about the world of Islam if he does not bring into it some sense of a living relationship with those of whom he writes. Now, Hurani's description of a living relationship is vital in any dialogue, either between individuals or between institutional religions on a more formal level. This is not just an exchange of ideas, but is also much more simple in these terms, an exchange of hospitality and human kindness. In any case, the practice of hospitality is central to all the major world faiths. It certainly is to Islam. 
and has shaped many cultures, not least the kaleidoscope of cultures, which is modern multi-faith Britain. That's the first principle. Second one, understanding, not ignorance. I continue to find it extraordinary how ignorant people of faith are of each other, be they Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, Jew, Jain, or Christian. Yet ignorance is the most terrible of cultural diseases, for from it stem fear, misunderstanding, and intolerance. To take one example, Islam has been consistently misunderstood and misrepresented in the West, and it continues to be. Dr. Aziz al Ami, professor of Islamic studies in the University of Exeter, has shown how the Western caricature of Islam has typically gone through three phases. Prior to the 16th century reformation, it was caricatured as intolerant and evil. During the 18th century, enlightenment as strange and ridiculous, and in modern times, as a faith to be feared. Professor John Esposito from Georgetown University, Washington, elaborated this in a paper given in Amman, Jordan, and I'm going to quote from it. He said this, we live in a world in which it remains common to speak of or see headlines with these terms, militant Islam, resurgent Islam, fundamentalist Islam, Islamic bombs, Islamic extremism, Islamic fanatics, Islamic guerrillas, and Islamic terrorism. Even the former Secretary General of NATO caused a stir when he spoke of Islam as the new communism, a remark which brought criticism and a hasty retraction. This is a cartoon comic world view, and in it, Islam is perceived as a threat to Western civilization. But it is not news to point out the more accurate picture the historic debt of Western scholarship to Islamic thought and, and practice, nor of the contemporary manifestations of outstanding cooperation. Jordan and Syria both now have formal institutes for the advancement of dialogue between Islam and Christianity. The Jordanian one is a particularly exciting example of an institute funded and promoted by royal patronage and which is set now to expand its base for dialogue to include Judaism, a tripartite dialogue of the three Abrahamic faiths, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Or it isn't news to speak of the many excellent centers for religious dialogue in South Asian culture in India, many of which I have visited, and which are too numerous to list nor to speak of the years of patient and often difficult work, for example in Britain, which went into the shaping of a new agreed syllabus for religious education in British schools. This excellent syllabus draws on all the major faiths in producing a syllabus to educate British children, which should do away with much of the past ignorance. This is a relatively new situation for people in Britain. Only within the past 30 to 40 years has Britain become a multicultural and multi-religious society. Take just one small concrete example in myself. In my school education, teaching about any other faith than Christianity simply did not exist. My six-year-old godson, however, spent an evening recently explaining the difference between Diwali and Guy Fawkes Night. This can only be positive in creating a culture of understanding and not ignorance. Then thirdly, reciprocity and not exclusivism. If we seriously want peace and harmony on our overcrowded planet, then friendship and respect we must have towards people of other faiths in a mutual way. This, of course, is more difficult for some religions than for others. I'm going to take two specific examples now, Islam and Christianity. Islam and Christianity are both missionary faiths. They make absolute claims and are anxious to promote their faiths. 
Muslims are commanded in the Holy Quran to act as witnesses for mankind, just as Christians are commanded in Holy Scripture to go into the world and preach the gospel. So the question to be put to both Muslims and Christians is this. Can believers who really believe passionately in their hearts that theirs is a missionary faith really be committed to dialogue? My own answer to this is that they must be, and that they have a distinguished history of doing so in the past as in the present. Take yourself as an individual as an example. Whatever your religious position, now ask yourself this question. Would you say of yourself that because you have a clearly and lovingly held identity within a particular religious faith, that your willingness to listen, to learn, and to grow is diminished by that? In any case, no religious faith encourages its members to commend their faith arrogantly, irresponsibly, or deceitfully. Now move on from this, and this is a question addressed to any who are in a majority religion. Is a majority faith willing to offer the same rights and privileges that it expects for its own members? This is a particularly urgent issue, whether it addresses minority Muslim groups in the West or whether it addresses minority Christian groups in the Muslim world. In Britain, there is a particular urgency as we address the question of Muslim schools as independent institutions financed partly by the state. In my own area of London, Ealing, moves to create a Muslim school were eventually blocked by the local authority on the grounds that it would create inter-religious conflict the majority community in that part of London being Sikh, and which community had led a vocal campaign against it. My own view on this is to emphasize the positive contribution which South Asian culture has made and is making to British life. I believe the solid commitment to religious faith from this community has helped to raise the profile of all religious faiths in Britain. British culture had come to think of religion as unimportant, a society which had begun to assume that everything has its price and can be measured and assessed in quantitative terms, has had to see some things, religious faith, as priceless. And this is certainly the view of the leadership of, of the mainstream churches in Britain. The Archbishop of Canterbury, in a recent address to the Muslim ulema at Al-Azhar University in Cairo, spoke of his role in guaranteeing religious freedom for all citizens. In prisons and hospitals, Christian chaplains help to ensure that the religious needs of those of other faiths are met. The Church of England has helped to finance a major academic and policy-making study on the role of the faith communities within Britain. I would want to ask, perhaps a bit provocatively, in how many other countries would the uh, established religion be prominent in securing the religious rights of those who are not of their faith? So to move on and to conclude. Finally, cooperation, not confrontation. In spite of all the complexities, there are many areas in the way we organize ourselves as societies where the religious traditions can and do develop wide areas of cooperation. The religious faiths, Christianity and Islam, can and do provide a strong basis for joint commitment to humanity's struggle to overcome evil, disease, and poverty. Let me point to just a few of these areas of cooperation. And the context I want to set this in is society. Devout followers of all faiths are encouraged to be responsible citizens and good neighbors. This in turn not only involves a certain lifestyle in community, 
but a private lifestyle which takes seriously a commitment to respect and to love others. In the contemporary Indian context, of course, this was superbly and incomparably demonstrated by Mahatma Gandhi. The commitment to moral values, the importance of the family, respect for a non-violent way of settling disputes, care for the poor and the underprivileged, and a sense of obligation and accountability to the one who judges all human life. Common religious faith would say that justice and integrity should be at the heart of society. Laws of society require a moral foundation. Experience shows that human beings cannot be improved by the imposition of law alone. This understanding affects our concepts of justice. It affects those who administer the law. It weighs in the balance those who rule. Justice must mean justice for all. So to conclude, we look for cooperation in working for peace based on tolerance and understanding. And this, of course, ties closely with work for peace in general, but is also much broader. Wherever we look in the world, xenophobia is an enemy to racial and religious harmony. Religion, when it is hijacked by extremists, will always do this. Work for tolerance is not accidental, but it needs to be sustained and vigorous. Violence is always violence, whatever the justification. Murder is always murder, especially when it is done in the name of God. So, to sum up, my argument is that religious faith is vital to the well-being and harmony of society, and it will continue to be so. And the Muslim community in Britain has a vital role in this, in challenging our secular society. There is no society which has survived without it. That's religious faith. The collapse of all formerly atheist states has proved this beyond doubt. Religious faith is not about to go away, now nor in the future. So policymakers need to be aware of this. Religious faith, if properly interpreted, is an enormous positive force for good in just some of the areas I've outlined. And I remain utterly convinced that the role of religions, Christianity and Islam in particular, within our own society, is a vital ingredient in the search for peace, order, and harmony in our own society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Taylor, for sticking well to time and keeping the meeting running on time. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Dr. Zakir Naik. He is president of the Islamic Research Foundation, is a medical doctor by profession, but has dedicated a lot of his life to spreading the, the truth of Islam worldwide, especially amongst millions of English-speaking audiences. Uh, he has more than 100 lectures and debates and symposia available on audio and video cassettes, uh, which are extremely popular. I've actually got a whole page, which I won't read out, and I think when you hear him, uh, his qualities will be obvious to you. I'd like to ask him to come and speak on family values and to try and stick to the topic of family values for the next 20, 25 minutes, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma abad, auz billahi minash shaitani rajim, bismillahi rahmani rahim. Hunna libasu lakum, wantum libasu lahunna. Bismillahi rahmani rahim, rabbish wa li sadri, wa yassir li amri, wa ahlul ugdata min lisani yafkahu kawli. Respected Reverend, Dr. Jamal Badwi, my respected elders, and my brothers and sisters. I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, blessings, and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. The topic allotted to me for this Christian Muslim dialogue is family values in Islam. Family values in Islam should not be judged by what individual Muslims do or what the Muslim society does. It should be judged according to the authentic sources. That's the glorious Quran and the Sahih Hadith. 
I have divided the family values into three broad headings, as those related to the children, that are the sons and the daughters, as those related to the spouses, that are the husband and wife, and those related to the parents, that is father and mother. Let's first discuss the family values related to the children, that's the daughter and the son. The glorious Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number six, verse number 151, as well as Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 31, that kill not your children for want of sustenance. For it is Allah who will give sustenance to you and your children. For killing of children is a major crime. Killing of infants, whether male or female, is prohibited in the glorious Quran. And a special reference is made in Surah Taqweer, chapter 81, verse number nine, that when the female child is buried alive, and she'll be questioned, for what crime was she killed? A special reference is made that do not kill the female children especially, because in the olden days, and especially in Arabia, before the Quran was revealed, it was a very common practice that when a daughter was born, very often she was buried alive. Alhamdulillah, after the revelation of the glorious Quran, this evil practice has discontinued in the Arab countries. But yet, unfortunately, it does persist in countries where I come from, like India, and certain countries, many to culture. And according to a survey done by Emily Beckinen on the BBC, on the program Let Her Die, the topic was assignment, she said that every day in India, more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted after they identified that they're females. Quran not only prohibits the killing of children, especially females, it even rebukes the thought of a person becoming sad at the news of the birth of female child. The glorious Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 58, the glorious Quran says that when news is brought to one of them of the birth of a female child, his face darkens and he's filled with inward grief. And he hides his face in shame from the people and thinks that should he let her live in contempt or should he bury her alive? Ah, what an evil choice. Quran rebukes the thought of a person becoming sad at the news of a female child. And our beloved Prophet said in Sahih Muslim, poem number four, hadith number 6364, that the Prophet said that anyone who upbrings two daughters correctly, with kindness and love, till they mature, they will be as close to this, these two fingers, on the day of judgment. And another hadith says that anyone who brings two daughters with love and compassion, till they become mature, they shall enter heaven. Once, there was a person who kissed his son and placed him on his lap in front of the prophet. Prophet objected and said that he should have even kissed his daughter and placed her on the other lap. The first guide was given in the glorious Quran to the whole of humankind is in Surah Ikra or Surah Alak, chapter 96, verse number one to five. He says, "Ikra bismi rabbik allazi khalak, khalak al insana min alak, ikra wa rabbuk al akram, allazi alam bil kalam, allam al insana ma alam yalam." Read, recite, or proclaim in the name of thy Lord who created who created the human beings from something which clings, a leech-like substance. Read, thy Lord is most bountiful, who taught men the use of the pen, who taught men that we did not know. The first guidance given to the humankind in the glorious Quran is to read. And the Prophet said that it is obligatory for every Muslim, man or woman, to acquire knowledge. And the Prophet told the parents that it is obligatory that they should educate the children, especially the daughters. Let's discuss the family values related with the spouses, that is the husband and wife. The glorious Quran refers to the woman as a muhasana, that's a fortress against the devil, unlike other religions, many of which, who consider the woman as an instrument of the devil. And a good woman, she keeps the husband on the straight path, 
on the Sirat al-Mustaqim and prevents him from going on the wrong track. Our beloved Prophet said, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in Sahih Bukhari, volume number seven, in the book of Nikah, chapter number three, hadith number four, that, O oh, young people, whoever has the means to get married should get married, for it will help you to lower your gaze and guard your modesty. In Islam, we are encouraged early marriage. If you have the means, you should get married earlier. And the glorious Quran says that if you don't have the means, keep yourself modest till Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the means. And our Prophet said, it's a hadith narrated by Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, that anyone who marries completes half his deen, half his religion. So one during question answer time, somebody asked me, that does it mean that if I marry twice, I complete my full deen, my full religion? What did the Prophet mean that marriage completes half your deen? What the Prophet meant was, marriage prevents you from promiscuity, from fornication, from homosexuality, which are half the evil in the society. Only if you marry, do you have an opportunity to be a husband or a wife. Only if you marry, do you have an opportunity to be a father or a mother, which are very important duties in Islam. So irrespective of whether you marry once or twice, yet you only complete half your deen. The glorious Quran says in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse 21, that amongst his signs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for you mates of like nature, so that you may dwell in tranquility with them, and he has put love and mercy between your hearts. The glorious Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 21, refers to marriage as a misaq, a sacred covenant. And for a marriage to solemnize, the permission of both would be husband and wife is equally important. That's the boy and the girl. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 19, that do not inherit the woman against the wishes. According to beloved Prophet, there's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7, in the book of Niqah, chapter number 43, hadith number 5138, that once a lady by the name of Khansa bint Khadim al-Ansariya, she approached the Prophet and said that she has been forced by her father to marry a man who she did not like and the Prophet nullified the marriage. Permission of both boy and girl is equally important for a marriage to solemnize in Islam. And in Islam, we prefer calling the woman folk by the correct terminology, not by the English word housewife. You know, because she's not married to the house to be referred to as housewife. You know, housewife means wife of the house. We prefer calling the women folk as homemakers because they make the home, they build the home. And She's married to an equal. In Islam, men and women are equal. Equality does not mean identicality. And the glorious Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 228, that the women have rights as against them on terms equitable, but the men have a degree of advantage. Many of the men, including many Muslims, they misunderstand the meaning of this verse, and they think that men are superior. Some of them think that the Quran says men are superior. And they quote a verse of the glorious Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 34, it says, Ar rijalu kawaman ala nisa, that the men are the kawam of the women. Kawam comes from the root word akama, which means to stand up for. What it actually means that the men have one degree of extra responsibility in supporting the women. They don't have one degree extra superiority in bossing over the women they have one degree additional responsibility in supporting the woman. Because the verse continues that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given one more strength than the other. And the glorious Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number 19, that treat your wives on footing of equity and kindness. And I started my talk by quoting a verse from the glorious Quran from Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 187, which says, Hunna libasul lakum, that they are your garments and you are their garments. The roles of husband and wife in a family are that like garments. You know, garments are used to conceal. Husband and wife should conceal each other's faults. They are used for protecting. They should protect each other. They are used for beautification. Husband and wife should beautify one another. It's a role of a hand and glove. And in Islam, the men are supposed to be the bread earner in Islam, in the family life in Islam. 
a woman, she need not earn her living. Before she's married, it's the duty of the father and the brother. And after she's married, it's the duty of the husband and the son to look after her boarding, clothing, lodging, and all financial aspects. She need not work for a living. She is financially more secure as compared to the man in Islam. But if she wishes to work, if there are financial problems, she may work as long as the atmosphere is Islamic and Islamic work and within the purview of the Islamic Sharia. Even during marriage, she is on the receiving end. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 4, that give to the woman a marital gift in Dawah. That means for a marriage to sermonize, a maher has to be given. The husband gives to the would-be wife a marital gift. It's compulsory. But in the country where I come from, that's India, the society is the opposite. The dowry is given by the woman to the husband, would-be husband. And it's a cultural practice which has poisoned the whole society. You know, if a woman has to marry a graduate, she has to give 100,000 rupees. If it's an engineer, she has to give 500,000 rupees. If it's a doctor, 1 million rupees, as they are selling, you know, herds and cattle in the marketplace. In Islam, it's prohibited to demand any dowry from the wife. Willingly, if the parents of the wife give certain gifts, they're most welcome. But demanding directly or indirectly is prohibited. You cannot say that my son, he likes to travel in a Mercedes car, indicating that you require a Mercedes car in dowry. My son likes to live in a four-bedroom flat, indicating that in marriage, I will marry my son to your daughter only if you give a four-bedroom apartment. Demanding directly or indirectly dowry from the would-be wife is not allowed in Islam. And if, suppose, the woman becomes a widow, unfortunately, she even gets her share. And a woman even inherits. She even gets maintenance in the period of idda, financial support. And even if divorce takes place, she gets financial support. And there is a great misconception amongst the people regarding why does Islam allow a man to have more than one wife? Time doesn't permit us to go into the details of why it allows, but just in brief, I'd like to say that in fact, all the religions, if you read the scriptures, they did give permission for the men to marry as many wives as they wanted. No religious scripture that I know of tells a man to marry one except the glorious Quran. In fact, if you read the Hindu scriptures, they give permission to as many as you want. It's later on that the Hindu priests or the Indian law restricted the marriage for a Hindu man to only one wife. Even the Old Testament, even the Bible, if you read, if you read the first Kings, chapter number 11, verse number 3, Solomon had 700 wives. Abraham had three wives. It's later on that the rabbi and the church put a restriction. Islam says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 3, that marry women of a choice in twos, threes, or fours, but if you can't do justice, marry only one. And the reason that people want, they can ask me the question answer time. But it is for the modesty of the woman that a man is allowed to marry more than one wife. It's not a fard. It's not compulsory that a man should marry. Some people think it's fard. Neither is it that you'll get more blessings if you marry more than one wife. It's optional. It's optional. But if you marry, the criteria is you should do justice. If you don't do justice, you are in trouble that divorce should never be given under normal circumstances. It is as a last resort if the husband and wife cannot get along as a last resort. Under normal circumstances, you should avoid it to the best ability you can, as a last resort. And in some societies, you can give divorce. In some societies, you can't. Some religions give permission, while the others don't. Some have certain restrictions. The Bible says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 31, 32, that it has been said of the old times that whosoever putteth a woman away, putteth a wife away, you should give a bill of divorce. That was the law of Moses, peace be upon him. That if you want to give a divorce, give a bill of divorce. But Jesus, peace be upon him, said, but I say unto you that whosoever putteth away his wife, except for fornication, he asks her to commit adultery. That means only in case of fornication can you give divorce according to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 31 and 32. And there's a lot of misconception regarding divorce in 
Islam. Basically, you can classify under five headings. That one is mutually given both the husband and wife. Second is unilaterally by the husband, by the will of the husband, he wishes.